Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the uh, seventh, I think, session in the Spring 2021 uh, Digital Cultural Heritage uh, session on um, the Sunokis Digital Classics program. Um, this session is going to be on uh, publishing 3D models and various implications, including the uh, intellectual property implications of some of these uh, issues and technologies and platforms um, around this. Um, this. This session, I'll, I'll introduce the presenters in a second, but this session is um, quite a nice um, uh, nexus of uh, points that have come up and of technologies that have come up in other sessions or that will come up in other sessions in this semester, um, such as the, the two sessions on 3D technologies, the very first session um, six weeks ago on 3D imaging and the session which will come up in two weeks time on 3D modeling, um, both of which um, could uh, quite easily provide you with um, models that you could use in the exercise that we're going to pre pre present at the end of this session. And also a couple of sessions um, on uh, knowledge production and um, indigenous heritage and intellectual property, um, which have come up um, in another strand throughout this semester. So the, these, a lot of these same issues will arise throughout um, these um, these sessions. Um, today's session is going to be presented by uh, my colleague uh, Alicia Walsh, who is um, an archaeologist at Recollection Heritage, um, and also Tom Flynn, who is the Cultural Heritage Lead at Sketchfab.com, and uh, Dinusha Mendes, who is a professor of IP law um, at the University of Bournemouth. Um, and I believe um, Alicia is starting us off. Um, please go ahead, Alicia. All right, you can see that okay? Yeah, we've got your slides now, yeah. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so um, hello everyone. Um, I'm gonna give a brief overview on different 3D methods um, that you can employ just to give some quick context to um, the overall discussion today. Um, and starting Alicia, with- Just quickly, yes. can you, can you yeah. click hide on that little, little oh, window yeah. of your Thank screen? You. Thank you. Oh, have I lost it now? <laughs> Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so starting with 3D, 3D imaging, and like Gabby mentioned, um, if you wanna learn more about this technique, I would welcome you to visit our first session on 3D imaging, where we provided a tutorial in photogrammetry. And likewise, in two weeks, we'll hold um, a more in-depth discussion on 3D modeling. Um, so we have made the distinction between imaging and modeling. Uh, 3D imaging is reproducing an object that exists in the, in the physical world. And this can be done using photogrammetry, 3D laser scanning, structured light scanning, CT scanning, and so on. Um, so essentially you're creating a digital copy of something that, as it exists now, um, whether it's complete or fragmented. And 3D modeling, on the other hand, is creating a three-dimensional digital image of an object that may or may not exist in the present. So you may have archeological foundations of a structure in reality, but you may want to reconstruct how the structure looked originally in its entirety. And you can do this through various uh, computer aid design programs such as SketchUp or Blender, as we're gonna discuss in session nine. Um, another 3D method commonly employed in our field is virtual reality. And this method works to simulate your presence in a virtual environment. Um, it uses the environment created through 3D modeling or 3D imaging, um, or it could be a combination of both. And so you, just by wearing a headset and moving your head or body around, you can be fully immersed in this virtual environment. Augmented reality, on the other hand, is a live direct or indirect view of a physical real world environment whose elements are augmented um, by computer generated components. So usually it's used through a phone or a tablet and you point your camera at a view and software gives you an overlay of that view on your screen. Um, so her for heritage purposes, it can be used for um, by pointing your phone camera at a ruin and the software could show you its reconstructed view. Um, another example, at the Allard Pearson Museum in Amsterdam, they did a project where they created three models of an object using photogrammetry um, so that when visitors came to the museum, they could download an app um, that when they 
point the camera at an object in the display case, the 3D model appears on their phone, um, so they could have a, an interact. You could they could interact with the object that they're seeing in real life. And then finally, we have 3D printing. And this is the production of a tangible version of a 3D file, um, which was created by either 3D imaging or 3D modeling. Um, however, it's usually not a direct replication. Um, usually some information is lost in the process of printing. So how do we distribute the work that we've created through these 3D methods of imaging, modeling, VR, and AR? Um, there are two main ways that we'll discuss today, um, publishing online or through 3D printing. And as Tom is going to give a presentation shortly on online hosting um, through Sketchfab, I will briefly go over why we 3D print, um, and then Danusha is going to explain some of the legal implications of 3D printing and 3D scanning. So why would we 3D print? Um, a few reasons that have been proven beneficial in our field include using the copies for education and public outreach. Um, as most archaeological materials cannot be handled frequently by the public um, due to their fragility or the material isn't physically accessible, um, 3D printing can give the opportunity for people to handle the object. Um, they can have a greater sensory experience with it and learn from its weight and texture. Um, and just have a connection that they otherwise would not by just looking at the object or an image of it. Um, there, it can also be used for experimental reconstructions and craft or creation processes. Um, 3D imaging and printing can be used to help an artist learn about traditional practices or further their education about a culture's history. So for example, um, Tanya Larson was studying her uh, Gwich'in ancestry at the Institute of American Indian Arts in 2015. And she carried out a project in which she used photogrammetry and laser scanning to create a collection of tools previously made by her ancestors in the Northwest Territories, um, particularly tanning tools and fishing spheres. So she 3D printed them out of sandstone um, to use as a reference model for building identical tools using traditional methods. Um, and traditional materials such as bone and antler. So she conducted the study to connect with her heritage and use new technologies as a way to recreate and continue her cultural traditions. And then the tools that she 3D printed were again um, made into like a more child-friendly model for museum visitors to handle so they can also learn about this culture in a more interactive way. So I'm just gonna go over how 3D printing works very quickly. Um, 3D printing is an additive manufacturing process, meaning it starts from nothing and the machine adds filament to create an object one layer at a time. So as this diagram illustrates, whatever you print needs to have something below it, um, a base of some kind, otherwise the filament will be too unstable to hold its shape. So first you would need an object to print, um, whether it's one you've created yourself, um, maybe you followed the photogrammetry tutorial on, in session one, um, or maybe you found one online and you had permission to download it. So first you would want to open it in a 3D editing program, such as Mesh Mixer, which is shown here. Um, you would need to convert it to a file type compatible with 3D printing. Um, the most commonly used one is STL um, because it contains only one color file and um, you are going to disregard any of the color files already on your 3D model. Um, so you'll end up with a simplified file looking like this. Um, and, oh, something happened. There we go. Um, so you'll also need to make sure that your object is watertight, uh, meaning that there are no holes in it. So if you had scanned an object and didn't include a base, um, your 3D model and your, your model just had a, like a gaping hole in the bottom, you would have to manually fill that in the program. And on Mesh Mixer here, you can use that using the inspector tool. 
um, then you can open the STL file in the software attached to your printer, um, as seen here. And you can reposition it, or you can resize it if it's not to the scale you want. And then, as I mentioned before, that 3D printing is an additive manufacturing process. There needs to be support for any overhanging parts. Um, otherwise, the filament will collapse. So you will create supports uh, to hold up these handles up, for example. And the software will print them thinly so that they are easy to snap off or cut off later. Um, and once you do that, you can you are able to file the areas down if you want, um, just to create a smoother surface, um, if that's what you're going for. And you can also select the quality of the print at this stage. Um, and there's a few other options that the software gives. So when you're printing, um, there are many sorts of materials that you can choose from. Plastics are pretty common. And um, the most common filaments are ABS and PLA. Uh, PLA is more biodegradable than ABS. However, ABS is more durable. So PLA probably should not be used for something you're going to leave outdoors for a long period of time um, because it will degrade eventually. But it is a, a good alternative for limiting our plastic use. And you can also print in metals, concrete, uh, sandstone, as I mentioned earlier, with the tanning and fishing tool example. Um, there was also a project through Leiden University and TU Delft, um, which studied cuneiform tablets in Syria. Um, one particular tablet had actually unfortunately vanished during the war, um, but they had previously created a model of it. So they 3D printed this in plastic, um, as well as in chocolate. So they ended up selling the chocolate uh, models and donating the proceeds to refugee students in the Netherlands. Um, yeah, so there are many options to print, uh, depending on what the object is and why you're doing it. Um, and eventually, you will end up with your own 3D copy of an object. Um, and again, like I mentioned, you can snap off the supports. Um, you could paint the object if you want to match the original. And yes, that is all I have to say about 3D printing, um, I'm sure. Uh, all of our speakers today could mention some other tips and examples um, of why we 3D print, but um, I think for now I'll pass it off to Tom. Cool. Thanks, Alicia. I think I should have my slides up if that works, Gabby. I'll take that as a yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> thanks. Um, so yeah, um, as um, Gabby mentioned, I am cultural heritage lead at sketchfab.com and Sketchfab is an online publishing platform for uh, interactive 3D models. So if you have a 3D model and you want to um, show it to somebody uh, via the internet, that's what Sketchfab lets you do. It's used by artists, designers, brands, cultural heritage organizations all over the world. Previously, I worked at the British Museum um, along with colleagues like Jennifer Wexler and uh, Daniel Pett, and we used uh, 3D scanning and 3D printing in our work there. We, there were 3D prints that were used in, um, on, or rather on handling desks um, in the museum, um, as well as in the uh, kind of class, classroom kits, uh, the educational kits that were handed out to children as well. Um, as well as that, I um, co-founded a project called Museum in a Box with George Oates, um, and that is all about 3D prints that can be sent to different uh, places um, from a museum, uh, extending the idea of a, a museum loan box. So there are plenty of examples, yeah, like Alicia says, of, of practical uses of, of 3D prints um, all over the place uh, to look into. But anyway, um, I get on to uh, talking about publishing. Um, these are the points I'm going to cover um, briefly, just an introduction to 3D and online publishing. Um, user agreements, file formats, display and viewing options, and content licensing. And this will be generally from the perspective of my experience uh, working at Sketchfab in, uh, over the last kind of four, four years um, with some examples along the way. So uh, a lot of what I'm talking about, um, specifically relating to 3D and uh, open access, making um, data available, 
freely uh, and copyright is covered in um, an online white paper that I co-authored with um, Neil Stimler and uh, Michael Weinberg uh, of the Engelberg um, Center for Innovation Law and Policy at NYU. Um, uh, so I, I, it's in the um, reading list, but um, I, I just recommend it again because it goes into quite a lot of detail about everything from 3D models um, to specific examples of, of open access. Um, to take a, a step back and, and just talk about 3D in general, um, over kind of the last, you know, however many years you want to look at, I think 3D has become a more common um, uh, aspect in digital, uh, in our digital lives, whether that's through um, our cameras on our phones or expensive Apple phones, at least um, being equipped with 3D scanning um, uh, LiDAR technology or with the, um, the way to consume uh, 3D content becoming more prevalent um, and cheaper um, and more invasive of our privacy, maybe through um, uh, headsets like the Oculus um, Quest. Uh, so there are huge investments being made into 3D um, for consumer level products. Um, and that that's kind of uh, the connection I think Sketchfab makes with cultural heritage organizations, although there's a strong educational and uh, uh, research component to the data that gets posted on Sketchfab um, as well. Um, again, stepping back, 3D models let you do, they, they support a whole range of um, possible uh, use cases uh, and, and are used in all kinds of industries from visual effects, education, e-commerce, gaming, um, all over the place. People are using 3D in different ways, whether that's a 3D model itself or a derivative. Speaking of which, I think it's a good idea to um, always bear in mind that when you're looking at something on a screen, even if it's 3D, so this is a rotating GIF of a 3D model, um, we should differentiate between, or I think we should, between a 3D model and a derivative. So whether it's a video or an image or, a, um, uh, or an animation, um, 3D for me really is about interactive um, uh, behavior that I can manipulate a 3D model. And that's what we, we, we mean when we say real time, you're interacting with something in real time when you can click your mouse and turn it around yourself, zoom in and out and uh, examine it like you would um, a real object you had in your hands. So <clears throat> you have some 3D data and you have some people you want to show it to. Um, and that's where Sketchfab uh, comes in. You take your 3D data, you upload it to the internet, um, Sketchfab does some magic, and then out the other side you have um, a 3D model that you can share just like you would an image or a video. There, there will always be some preparation that you would do with your 3D data before you upload it to the internet, whatever platform you use, um, because it as, a, as an, uh, a similar process you would apply to images that you wouldn't upload your highest resolution TIFF uncompressed TIFF file to embed on a web page, you would produce probably a JPEG and reduce it to a sensible size before you publish it so that it doesn't take forever to download uh, and people can look at it on their phone or on their uh, tablet, on their desktop, uh, on different devices, older hardware. Um, Sketchfab does um, a lot to compress and optimize 3D data, but you, when you're publishing online, there is that component of optimizing your 3D data to, to make it perform better uh, on a, a digital screen, um, as well as it just being a generally, uh, you know, less energy consuming um, uh, output. So if, if you try and display a, a very complex 3D model uh, on any device, it will use up more energy than if you were looking at a, an optimized version of that same object. Um, we can talk about publishing in a, in a couple of different ways, I think. There's publishing so that people can view a 3D model. Um, they can access a visualization of that data and interact with it, as I said, in real time. And then publishing the data itself um, gives people access to the source 3D files and uh, under a particular license makes it available for reuse. Um, so that's two, two ways that I um, talk about publishing. Some considerations that um, 
this is is not an exhaustive kind of list uh, and it's really just kind of from from my experience some things that i've picked up through discussions i've had with um, museum professionals um, and, and other people working in 3d but um, simply but i think there are ethical considerations when you're digitizing producing 3d content especially with 3d scanning also with um, you know the cgi workflow that alicia mentioned as well um, do people have the right to digitize something in the first place and to distribute it um, which isn't the same as the legal right to digitize or publish something um, and these are you know even before you've got to the step of publishing something online um, considerations about the the object that you are looking to create a digital file from and then there are the technical aspects um, is it possible to to host that file on a web server somewhere um, what technical skills do you need to access it um, is it expert non-expert audiences um, are they able to click a link online to access the 3d file um, whether that's through a website or, or via some code different ways that you can make your data available and then practically do people know about your 3d data if you publish your 3d file somewhere online that doesn't mean that it will get to your audience there's a um, a need to tell people about the 3d that you're um, hoping that they'll look at as well uh, and then when they do go to look at it it, it should be in a in a format uh, available as a um, easily viewable web standard for example without any plugins without downloading an app you want to make it as easy as possible for people to get to your your 3d data so there are tons of places you can um, uh, publish 3d or put 3d online in various ways some make it interactive others are for selling your 3d models sometimes it's um, ar or vr oriented um, th there are plenty of different options you have obviously i'd say sketchfab is is the best um, but you you um the sim similar kind of processes that i'll cover in a second or similar um uh, elements of the process uh, will be true across all of these and it's worth noticing that so google poly and microsoft remix 3d so two very big companies some of the biggest companies were um, running 3d publishing platforms but have closed them down in the um, last um, few years in fact i think poly still online right now but i think come june it will be shutting down so there's that um uh, aspect of whether you're going to uh, self-host your 3d files or if you're going to use a uh, commercial service and there are different uh, benefits uh, it's a lot you need a lot more technical expertise to self-host um, uh, but you will have to agree to for example uh, user agreements when you're using a third-party service um, but that might increase your reach it's, it's always a balancing act uh, of what you're trying to do uh, and what resources you have um, so one way of thinking about publishing your 3d would be to publish it in many places at once to reach different audiences uh, particularly um, whether you're using sketchfab you might also be using um, a self-hosted 3d viewer or publishing on another platform as well um, and it's not to say that there are exclusive audiences there are um, probably crossovers between audiences as well but your strategy with again going back to the idea of you need to tell people about your 3d you need to bring uh, the 3d to where they are for them to um, access it i think that's common of not just 3d but any data or information online um, user agreements um, to take sketchfab as an example when you sign up to um, a platform or, or service to publish 3d you will probably be agreeing to a, a terms of use um, which covers various um, different uh, aspects of the, the service you're using and the legal agreements that you're um, signing up to. Um, to take just a, a kind of short example out of the uh, terms of use at Sketchfab, we have um, a section about user content and some specific, I think, uh, relevant points here. Um, when you're using Sketchfab, as an example, um, you are solely responsible for ensuring that any user content, so that's the 3D mo models you upload, um, complies with any applicable laws, third party rights, including but not limited to any intellectual property rights, privacy rights, and publicity rights. So you, you are representing when you upload to Sketchfab that you have the right to do so. Um, uh, as well as um, Sketchfab does not um, 
claim any rights to your 3D data. You can take it off Sketchfab at any point, but by using the service of Sketchfab, you grant Sketchfab a worldwide, non-exclusive, royalty-free, perpetual, irrevocable, sublicensable um, uh, right to license and uh, display your work. And that sounds like a lot, but it's essentially giving Sketchfab the ability to deliver its service. So you're saying uh, when Sketchfab delivers an embed of your 3D model somewhere online, you are agreeing to them uh, being able to do, do that. Um, another element, I added this slide just at the sort of last minute. Um, Sketchfab, um, or I should say my work is within the community team at Sketchfab. And uh, there's a section in the terms related to intellectual intellectual property claims. So if you were the creator of a 3D model or uh, uh, an object and you saw it on Sketchfab and you said, I didn't give permission for that to be online, um, to be published uh, in 3D on Sketchfab, there is a process um, that Sketchfab operates um, the, under a DMCA, um, which stands for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Um, which basically means that you can send Sketchfab an email requesting um, the take the taking down of that content based upon you proving that you, you are the owner of that, that content and some contact details. And by respecting that, Sketchfab um, uh, tries to operate in good faith with all the creators on its platform as well as the creators that are not on its platform. Um, some interesting um, takedown notices that I've been privy to um, our uh, 3D scan that I've made of a sculpture in a park in London. And um, probably about two years after I published it and I hadn't thought about it, the uh, estate that uh, represented the artist who died in the 90, late 1980s contacted Sketchfab saying, remove all of the 3D models of this artist's sculptures from your platform. So Sketchfab did. Um, I was contacted about a 3D scan of a Triceratops skull that I had created uh, and optimized uh, by the museum uh, who hold that um, uh, tricer tri tri Triceratops skull, um, who weren't happy with me licensing it for a fee through the Sketchfab store. Um, so I complied with that as well. And that got me thinking about, well, this Triceratops skull, who is owning the copyright in this, this skull? I mean, in the, in the case here, like I said, I, I removed it from the store uh, to comply with the museum. Um, and there, there are plenty of interesting um, kind of copyright claims that we get um, and different ways that different companies, organizations, individuals enforce their, their rights. Uh, a cartoon um, uh, uh, creator, rather a television network contacted, contacted Sketchfab asking us to remove all of the content related to one of their productions. And in conversations with them, um, it turned out they really were more interested in stopping people making that content downloadable uh, and adding it to the Sketchfab store. So that in the end, the content remains on the site um, as fan art. Um, and like I say, it often depends how far uh, an organizational person is wants to go with um, uh, exerting their rights on certain content. Um, Okay, file formats, um, all different kinds of software, whether it's computer aided design for manufacturing, product design, uh, sculpting tools, 3D creation tools, photogrammetry, 3D scanning softwares can often spit out all kinds of different files, all kinds of um, different versions of those files. Um, and uh, what you ideally are able to do and what Sketchfab aims to do is to accept all of those files and then uh, do some magic to convert them into a generic file that can be published um, anywhere online. So this is the, the upload screen from Sketchfab. You just drag and drop any of your 3D files, all the major um, commonly used files, and uh, you can upload them with texture files, material files, um, and, and related files. If you wanted to add um, some uh, metadata as a text file as well, you could upload that as well. Uh, to create a download package. You upload it to Sketchfab, it does some work, and uh, then you have your 3D embed. What Sketchfab also does uh, is convert, uh, automatically convert uh, 3D files you upload into two modern interchange formats, USDZ and GLTF. And these are primarily, not, not exclusively, um, uh, or rather I should say one way that they're used 
the USDZ and the GLTF files are um, the, the files that modern smartphones use to display augmented reality. So um, for iOS, uh, you would publish a USDZ file to um, make it viewable in AR on an uh, Apple device. And for Android devices, it's the GLTF file. So whatever you upload to Sketchfab will be converted into these files. And you can make that, if you choose, you can make that file available for people to, um, to view uh, or download. Display and viewing options. Um, just wanted to give a flavor of um, the 3D editor that Sketchfab has kind of behind the scenes and the different things that you can do to adjust uh, all aspects of your 3D model to um, uh, and how they affect the understanding of that, that object. So here I'm changing the, the materials of the, um, the 3D scan here. This is a um, statue of a Pacific Island God that I made while at the British Museum. And um, I think as things change, lighting is added, um, the objects made more shiny, less shiny, see through all of these different things, di different backgrounds, um, different color adjustments all affect our understanding of uh, this object. Um, so whenever you're looking at a 3D model or I guess any media online, I think it's worth considering, you know, what am I looking at? How has it been edited? Um, how true to the original is that? Um, keeping with this example as well, um, Aside from adjusting the, the materials of the of the object, or you can probably see that there are some numbered dots on the uh, the statue here, and their annotations. As you click them, you get some more information about that particular um, point on the um, statue. But um, Sketchfab also has a, an AR VR editor, so that you can scale um, the three D model that you've uploaded to make it ready for viewing in VR or AR. So this is kind of um, the the, the the VR editor and you can see I think the 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 stand-in kind of man here I think is just about five and a half feet or six feet I can't remember exactly but the grid on the floor is uh, one meter um, so we're scaling the object to the right scale so that when you um, look at it on Sketchfab you can view it on screen so that's the the portrait on the left there with the annotation cycling through you could look at it in uh, virtual reality so the top right that's via a Google Cardboard uh, or an augmented reality, which give you a different perception of the object's scale. Um, so these are, these are different ways that you can display a, a 3D object. Content licensing. Um, Sketchfab operates a, um, a store, so people can make 3D models available um, under royalty-free licenses for commercial reuse uh, for a fee. And that's one way uh, that Sketchfab um, uh, makes money. Um, and another way that, that models are made available on Sketchfab is for free um, under Creative Commons licenses. So the original uploader decides whether they want to make a model downloadable or not, and then they can choose the kind of um, Creative Commons attribution license. Excuse me, that um, the model is available under. So here is the download uh, dialog that pops up when you click download. This model is free under CC attribution. The author must be credited. Commercial use is allowed. Uh, we recently added a button that I've added a big arrow to uh, to help people um, uh, respect the attribution um, uh, clause in this, this license. So copying and pasting um, that content. And you can see we've got different download buttons for different formats that I mentioned earlier. Um, the attribution license can be extended to include other clauses like uh, you like non-commercial, like the model is only available for non-commercial use, um, or share alike, uh, meaning that whatever you make using that 3D model must be made available under the same license. Um, what, what's the other one? Non-commercial, share alike. Um, I forget the the other flavor right now, um, but the idea that you can you can kind of choose how you're making your data available. And we provide a um, uh, help center article, again, to help people credit and um, uh, respect the licenses. Not, no derivatives. I'm reading it off this page now. No derivatives, you're saying, is the other kind of flavor of license. You're saying you can't make a change to this 3D model. You must pass it on unchanged uh, if you reuse it. 
we recently i'll try and speed up a little bit we recently um uh launched a public domain um, initiative for cultural heritage uh, on sketchfab so um we have a collection of just under 2000 3d models that were dedicated under the cc0 public domain dedication um so creative commons i should say creative commons um zero public domain dedication which means that you can reuse those 3d models for absolutely any purpose um without any need to credit the original um, uploader or sketchfab you can take them you can uh, make a 3d print and sell it in a shop you could put it in uh, to know your your film or your video game you can do absolutely anything you want with it when you dedicate something to the public domain you um you uh give up all rights related to that although i'm sure Denisha will probably have a better grasp of um the law here um and that's something we're, we're trying to kind of grow uh, uh as a collection on sketchfab some nice things happen when you publish your 3D models for download. This is a still from a Post Malone uh, video that's been seen some 300 million times on YouTube. And in the very first few seconds, uh, in the bottom right, you get a glimpse of this um, shield, which is um, a parade shield um, published on Sketchfab um, by National Museums of Sweden. Um, and uh, you never know where your 3D may end up. But I think that's the interesting exciting thing about making your data available under open access um, uh, is that it can become part of something else uh, entirely that you may not have expected that's where i'll stop thanks for listening thanks tom that's that's uh, that's a fantastic overview there great um over to dinusha i guess Thank you, Gabby. And um, hopefully you can see my screen or you can see the screen, my slides. Yes, we can see your slides, yeah. All right, thank you. So um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really sorry, first of all, I should say that um, you can't see me on the screen, but that's because before the session, we had some issues with my internet connection. So I'm keeping the video off, uh, but hopefully you can hear me uh, nice and clearly. So I'm gonna just uh, say a few words about um, the intellectual property the implications and my slide says about the development of industrial 3d printing however i want to kind of go back to what alicia was saying about you know how for example um, a model is created and it could either be through uh, 3d scanning or it can be through 3d modeling uh, ar vr and of course 3d printing is also kind of one aspect of that so what i would like to do is kind of pick up on the first two which is uh, 3d modeling and uh, look at also 3d scanning in the context of 3D printing, and then give you some um, kind of some uh, just a little bit of an insight into what it means from the context of intellectual property. And uh, what I would like to share is some results from a study we carried out for the European Commission. So it's a project that I led, and we completed that last year. So that is some of the things I'll mention is from that project. But also, I've been working in this field now since 2012. So I will also bring some of the knowledge from those years as well. Um, so just to start with, um, when we talk about intellectual property in this area and about 3D printing and also um, looking at modeling and scanning, um, I should say that um, one of the first kind of projects in this, in the context of 3D printing, was commissioned by the UK Intellectual Property Office, and that was back in 2013. Um, it was led by uh, Bournemouth University. And uh, we completed that project in 2015. So there had so it kind of started off uh, then. And um, and whilst of course this area and of course 3D printing has been around for so many years, well before that, and you know, all the way back to we can trace it in the 1970s and the first commercial 3D printer in 1988. However, after the first patents um, expired, there was this kind of a move to the more consumer market and. Hence, why there's been a little bit more fo uh, focus in this area in more recent times. So that's one of the first projects. Um, there was a project which really looked at the cultural institutions, and here we uh, focused on jewelry, and particularly ancient and modern jewelry. Um, and here the idea was to understand the uh, um, intellectual property implications surrounding 3D scanning, printing, and mass customization. Um, and this was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, uh, done between 2015 and 2017. Um, and 
and some of, and of course I should say that like the report from the UK Intellectual Property Office, there are three reports that are available on the UK IPO website. There's also um, results from the second project, which is uh, actually available also on the CREATE website at the University of Glasgow because it was funded by the HRC through the University of Glasgow. And there's a third project, which is in more recent times, um, carried out between 2017 and 2019. And this was, again, commissioned by the UK Intellectual Property Office. And this is where, based on the recommendations that we made in our first project back in 2015, the UK IPO took that forward um, and commissioned a second project, which was led by Angela Daly, and that was completed in 2019. But as I said, um, what I'm going to say, so I will bring up some of those, um, I will bring up some of the results from those projects as well. But this um, report here, which was published last year, which was carried out for the European Commission, um, is probably, I would say, one of the very large um, projects on intellectual property and uh, 3D modeling, 3D scanning, printing that's been carried out. And there's a quite a large team, as you can see here. It's quite a big report of 255 pages, but I'm also happy to say there's a very nice executive summary of only three, four pages. So um, you can get a quick overview as well, you know, if you don't have the time to read the entire report. Um, so the, pro the this particular project was about looking at the IP rights holders and uh, looking at the IP framework uh, for IP rights holders and users in 3D printing. Then that is, of course, looking at it from the context of modeling and scanning. And, um, and most importantly, the project looked across um, seven sectors. So aerospace, automotive, health, consumer goods, construction, energy, and industrial and tooling. So whatever kind of we, so when we talk to different uh, companies, we were very much focusing on these seven sectors. And in some ways, I would say that these sectors do capture most of the areas, um, you know, that's, I guess, uh, applies um, to modeling and scanning. And when we do talk about consumer goods, I know the cultural heritage is not exactly specifically mentioned here, but, um, when we did look at consumer goods, we of course looked also, I mean, uh, Tom has spoken very in depth about uh, like Sketchfab and uh, what's available there, but also we did also reach out and understand about what's going on in the public domain and the cultural institutions as well. So a quick overview of the team, that was myself, but also a number of others um, from the IP team, but also from industry, also from policy as well. Um, and in understanding the, um, IP implications, we, one way to do this, of course, would have been to approach it from the intellectual property perspective. So really try to understand it from going through protection, infringement, what are the exceptions, you know, take a lead from the legal side, or we could have taken a lead very, like very much from the, from the modeling, scanning, printing side. So this is what we did. We actually took a perspective from the 3D printing process, the 3D printing process being the sort of the final step in this. So we looked at, as you can see in the first square, um, if you are designing, and we call it a CAD file or a slash 3D model, you know, what kind of tools are you using? How are you using it? Are you kind of creating it from scratch? Um, are you, for example, 3D modeling it or are you scanning it? Then once you create it, what do you do with it? Are you sharing it online or through online platforms? Or are you going to be 3D printing it at home? Or are you going to be sending it to somewhere like Sketchfab to have it printed or use another service? Um, and then if you are printing, you know, what kind of, like what are you using? Like materials, that's of course protected by intellectual property laws too. And um, what, and then what about the hardware I use? And what about the file? And we heard about file formats. And uh, there's this the STL file or is it a different type of file? and then about the distribution of the good, and then of course the licensing. So in all of these aspects, there are intellectual property implications attached to all of them. And so our job was to try and break down each of them and then try and understand what what well, like what like it means from an IP perspective. Um, and I should maybe also quickly say in relation to this slide that when we were looking at IP, we were very much focused on all aspects of IP. So we were looking at copyright, trademark, patent, design, also trade secret, 
and, and also database rights as well. Um, so, but today I'm going to pick up just a few things because that's a massive, and I'm not going to go through all of them, probably comment more from a copyright perspective, but I will also share some other thoughts as well. So our empirical study was to carry out various interviews with a number of different companies. Uh, we interviewed 41 companies in the seven sectors, uh, looking at different parts of the value chain, so all the way from simulation to data capture to design, file preparation, material, process, post-process, product, end of life. We spoke to very large companies, especially in the aerospace and auto or in the automotive, but um, we also spoke to SMEs as well. And uh, we tried to get a cross-section of the companies from across the EU. So um, we, spoke to, uh, we spoke to companies across 14 member states. Okay, and this is a very quick snapshot of the, our, um, some of our uh, conclusions, and I'll come to some of them. So you can see we've gone, we've gone through the 3D process, but then um, looking at it from the IP perspectives of protection, infringement, exceptions, licensing, and traceability. And these are some of our um, uh, recommendations as well. Okay, so I want to kind of move on to the protection of the uh, 3D model or the CAD file. And um, I it kind of I was thinking of this, and um, this is actually quite an old quote now, and it's from 2013. But I really like it because I feel it captures the essence of what I want to say. So here it's really focusing on the 3D printer, and it's talking about an a 3D printer without an attached computer and a good design file is as useless as an iPod without music. And I thought that you know that's really interesting because um, I guess when we think of uh, creating like you heard you can you can of course model it you can scan it but of course you know uh, even to print something you must have something that you have created right and uh, if you don't have it then what do you actually print in the end so uh, in this sense the software becomes very very important um and these are just a very basic um and we saw much more sophisticated pictures now in uh, tom's presentation but this is just a very basic uh, file that's uh, been put together. And um, on the right-hand side, or maybe your left hand, I'm not sure, but um, you'll see the, uh, like the construction graph, which has been captured inside a red box. And this is quite an important aspect and, uh, of this file, because on the one hand, if you look at it from a legal perspective, we have the, the drawing, and then you have the written iteration of that on the, on the other side. And you know, what, is really, what is the significance of this? I mean, you might ask. So the significance is that um, on the one hand, you might be just creating a product um, uh, for maybe, let's say, just to model it or maybe for printing it. Um, but then you might also, just as we saw in Tom's presentation, you might give the customer lots of different options to change it. I mean, you might start by giving a piece of jewelry and then say that, you know, you can change the way it looks. You might change the stone. You might change the the band, you can change the shape. So there are various ways you can change it. So if you are changing all those different options, um, you are giving customization op options to a consumer. In which case then, I go back to that file and show you the little uh, iteration, the construction graph inside the red box. That becomes much more complex. It becomes almost like what, I've, what I'm showing you here, which is just the very beginning of a very, very long construction graph. And more complexity there is, the longer this construction graph is, which then takes us to the question, and this is something that's come across, that we have come across in all our work from 2013, all the way up to now, since we published this report last year for the commission. And that is, you know, is there, for example, you know, is this protected? Or like, for example, um, again, in Tom's presentation, was he referred to it as 3D data? Is this data or is it something more than that? And should there be any protection for someone who's actually creating these modeling options? Is this, for example, coding? Is this a computer program? What is this? So um, these questions have always come up for us. And like I said, we have, and even in our projects for the UK IPO, this was something that was really coming up through other companies. So we try to seek uh, from the, uh, companies that we interviewed across the 14 member states, we asked, you know, the, the, we asked this question, uh, there's a lack of clarity in the 
law regarding the protection of computer design files, so the file that captures the model. And um, and the, the interviewees are asked to indicate their level of, uh, of agreement with this statement. And as you can see, um, there's the majority of them either strongly agree or agree that there is a lack of clarity in the law. And, and um, so, and this is something that, of course, even the commission, when it before the commission even commissioned us to carry out this project, there was actually another paper that was written which identified that they needed more clarity in the law. So, but you know, what what clarity are we seeking here anyway? Okay, we know there's a lack of clarity, but where is the lack of clarity? So, this is where we start to ask ourselves, like, what type of work is this model? What type of work is this, what, what type of work is this design file? Um, is it, for example, a computer program? Is it like, is there a source and object code involved? And especially if you are creating a program which allows the consumer to customize the product at the end, which means what you are creating is actually, you're changing the model you are actually seeing here on the screen. It is not what you see here. It will become something different and you are giving those options. Um, or is it 3D data? Maybe it is. And, uh, you know, as Tom was speaking, he referred to it as 3D data, and, um, and maybe that is what it is. Um, or is it just instructions? You know, like maybe it's mathematical instructions, and, or, you know, um, and maybe this, this is one way of looking at it as well. Um, and of course, we have different, for, I won't go into this because this has been now talked about quite a bit, but there are different file formats. And, you know, like example again, you can see just from IP perspective in the CAD file. This is where all the, the IP sits. But then, of course, for it to be printed, you have to uh, change it over to a different file format. And for example, I'm showing here the STL file. And again, the STL file for a piece of jewelry that you can change all the, uh, you have these parameters and you can change it and you can change the way the piece of jewelry looks. So again, you know, there are questions there as well. So going back to then this model and what is it and uh, you know how do you protect it and where is this lack of clarity? So we have the 3D model. We've got the written iteration of the 3D model, which is now in a blue box. And then we have this CAD file, STL file, where there's a difference between where the IP is captured. And then we ask ourselves, what does this mean from um, from a legal perspective? And in the for first way of the 3D model, that's quite straightforward because we can say what we see here. And with copyright, it doesn't have to be the most prettiest form of object, it can be quite mundane, but you know, we can see it is artistic work, the written iteration of the 3D model. Um, this is the interesting one, you know, is it a literary work under copyright? Um, or if, it, or for example, can we say the, the, the file, the CAD file where this is captured, can this be seen as a smaller computer program within the large computer program? So what I mean by this is that if you draw an analogy, to Microsoft Word, you have that, which allows us to do, or Microsoft PowerPoint, which I'm using right now. Code has been written. I've done, I have created this presentation. I'm presenting it. But then it's the same way that if I was to use Microsoft Word, it allows me to write something. But when I write a book, that book is mine. Uh, so is there, some, is there a new creation within that larger creation? And so that is why the question is, is it really data? Is it a computer program? Is it something else? And um, so, what? And I'm just I'm not going to go into the law as such, but these are other these are the kind of the the legal positions as the 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 world um, the the WIPO Copyright Treaty. There's something called TRIPS, and there's the Information Society Directive. So all of this kind of back up back up point on the computer program aspect. But what we would say is that um, so there is a lack of clarity, and particularly from a patent, copyright, and design laws perspective. We do make some recommendations to the European Commission, um, and here on the slide, um, you can see what we have suggested. So what elements of a CAD file can constitute the subject matter of protection? Then, of course, carry a separate legal assessment of the CAD file and the 3D model it encompasses. And then also under copyright law, recommend clarifying that software embedded in a file can be considered a computer program in accordance with EU copyright law. We've whether this was quite an important aspect, especially when it comes to 3D modeling. Um, and also, we do feel that the 3D model, of course, should be seen as a distinct work, separate from the resulting physical product. So you have something that is captured as the electronic model, then you have the physical, maybe the 3D printed model. 
and those should be uh, two distinct uh, pieces of work. Okay, so a few words about scanning. I'm conscious of time as well. Um, so this is something we were doing in a, car, in a museum and we were 3D scanning this piece of jewelry that you can see on the top, on the, the, the first picture there. Um, there's a second one that we were also going 3D scan. What you can see in the laptop is a 3D scan. The first attempt at 3D scanning, it became a black blob. Um, Alicia was mentioning in her presentation that you had to also make sure that everything is watertight or what you see is a black, like a gaping hole. And that is exactly what happened to us. There was a gaping hole. And so we had to put these blue felts to make sure that it is watertight. And then ultimately we were able to come up with this uh, 3D scan that you can see um, over here. Um, and this was my colleague in this kind of um, kind of stance. And, you know, it, I guess we don't realize sometimes how uh, with 3D scanning, it's a lot of skill. It can also be angles. So, um, and, and all of that, you know, play into the uh, role of uh, 3D scanning. Again, we want to kind of ask ourselves, is there a lack of clarity within the ownership of uh, scanning design data? So when you when you do scan uh, a product, and here again, lots of uh, you know agreement on there is a lack of clarity. But what is interesting about uh, scanning and what it does, of course, produces like data when you when you do scan something. Um, that that actually created a different set of challenges. And of course, scanning is not straightforward. It needs sophisticated equipment. You also need know-how. You also need to understand about angles, about lighting. Um, and what, what also came up from this discussion is whether um, it's not so much about the law change, but it's actually more about the enforcement. And of course, these days, it's quite easy to scan as well. We have apps that allow us to do that quite easily. So this is where, for example, um, we feel that because when you look at intellectual property, intellectual property does not protect data. You know, that can be done, for example, under laws like contract law. So it was quite clear to us that uh, when it came to scanning, uh, the law is clear, but actually it was more the enforcement that seemed to be more of an issue. So... Um, our conclusions here was that the law is clear, but there seemed to be confusion amongst our interviewees. Um, again, important to distinguish between the model um, and the file, which could potentially be considered a computer program. Um, and we did not recommend that the law be changed here in this context because data per se um, cannot be protected under intellectual property laws. Um, final few words, if I still have, if I'm still okay for time, Kelly. Um, yes, fine. Yes, go okay. Ahead. So, uh, okay. So, I just wanted to maybe say a few words about um, bringing together what we're talking about today, and also a little bit about traceability and bringing in blockchain as maybe a part solution. So, this could be because one of the things we looked at, of course, was that when we are distributing, what does it mean for traceability of these digital files, which earlier maybe were not as widely distributed as they are today, whether it's a file that has been created as a result of 3D modeling or scanning, what does that mean? So could blockchain be an effective solution to that? Um, and it, we, we think that it could be an effective solution, but, but what, what it cannot do is it cannot control the type of printable objects. And back in 2018, the European Parliament actually made some recommendations, which we found quite interesting, but we also think that none of these are absolutely perfect solutions. So one is a global database of printable objects. But then who decides? I mean, who is going to be the, who's going to oversee this database? I mean, who will be kind of the gatekeeper of that? Um, so th I think there are some questions there. About it, there's a potential to introduce a legal limit on the number of private copies. I mean, this potentially, of course, there are countries like Germany and other European countries where, um, you know, there is like a levy and you can you can maybe, um, and also a private copying exception. So this could potentially be done. Um, and uh, I mean, and also imposing a tax like a levy on 3D printing to compensate IPR, ho uh, IPR holders. I mean, these are all about, about the printable object. But then again, when we think about traceability, you know, what does that mean? And so this is where we want to understand what does traceability mean from an IP and product liability perspective? Um, 
And here we want to understand whether the interviews think that blockchain would be a good uh, a good solution. And again, we had strong uh, agreement on that. So you can see um, majority of them think that this is a, a great solution to go ahead with, but um, they do bring up some challenges. For example, they point out that some formats, it is even impossible to place a watermark where there is no metadata of changes or, or where the changes cannot be traced because the source code is encrypted. Um, also, majority of our interviewers did think that whilst blockchain is good, what is more important, however, is a clear and inexpensive system that works in practice. But they all agreed that traceability will become more relevant and they will receive far more attention in the coming years as 3D printing and all these things we're talking about today will spread, both in industrial and privacy settings. Um, but it was emphasized that the industry has some important technical issues to address. For example, things like quality management, assurance, simplicity, the reliability of production, material reliability, and so on. So that's um, what I want to share with you. And I'll pass on, and thank you for your attention. And I'll pass on to Gabby now. Thank you, Gabby. Lovely. Thank you very much, Danusha. That's a really useful summary of um, both of the legal issues and of this particular study, um, thinking about and addressing those those issues. I think that's um, that's really useful, and that, that'll that'll help us a lot in um, in thinking about um, putting this sort of thing into practice um, as we're we're talking about for the for the exercise. Um, so um, a quick note to anybody watching live, please um, please feel free to ask questions in the um, in the live chat feature, which is probably to the right of your video. If you're if you're watching it in um, normal view, it may be below the video or in some more obscure place if you're watching it on an app of some kind. But there is a live chat feature that you can use to ask questions. We've got one or two in there already, which we'll look at in a moment. Um, and um, uh, we we can also um, discuss a little bit more. I don't know if anybody here has any um, any further comments or questions for each other or anything they want to want to add before I before I go any further. Um, I had a question probably for Tom. Um, I was wondering if there are like best practice guidelines through Open Glam on um, including your accompanying data with when publishing 3D models on Sketchfab. So like say your metadata and stuff, like should you always be doing that when you're also making your model uh, downloadable? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you mean um, the data about the object itself as well as how it was made or that, that digital copy was made. Um, uh, the recommendation I give people if they ask me is yes, definitely do include that. Um, you can either include it with, like I say, as a kind of supplementary file, as a PDF or a text file in the upload folder that you uh, put on Sketchfab. But also commonly, and what I think is a, is a great idea, is to don't consider Sketchfab the um, archive and the repository of your 3D data. It's the tool you're using to show people that 3D data. So you link back to your repository where all that uh, data is, the metadata, the paradata, um, <laughs> Astrid waving. Um, you you kind of um, you have like somewhere where where all that truth is kept, uh, as opposed to assuming that it's going to be you know travel around with your file. Um, there are certain things that get embedded in files. You you know you can embed some metadata in files, and some is included from the software that you use, like made with MetaShape or made with Blender or something. Um, and when um, you download a, a GLTF file, for example, from Sketchfab. It also includes the license information uh, as the metadata uh, field in the file. So it's not visible on the 3D model, but it's it's in the data if you, you go poking around. Um, there are various um, um, resources and um, recommendations from different people, uh, different organizations. There's the 3D data uh, metadata model from the Smithsonian Institution. There's some recommendations from the Europeana Task Force for 3D uh, regarding metadata. Um, what I see from the hundreds of museums uh, and cultural organizations publishing on Sketchfab, it's very, um, it varies massively, and most commonly, little data is uploaded with uh, the 3D. I don't know if that's because they're not keeping it or making it or capturing it, uh, or if they, they just haven't kind of linked it uh, on Sketchfab. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so there's an, another question about Sketchfab um, in the um, in the live chat, which we might as well um, pull up now while we're 
on the subject. So Phoebe asks, how often and under what circumstances are um, requests to take down content um, denied? Mm -hmm. What is the burden of proof for, for something to sure. be taken down? Sure. So uh, under the DMCA um, program that Sketchfab operates, if somebody submits a I should mention I'm not a lawyer, so you know this is my my uh, take on this right now. Um, if somebody submits a well-formed DMCA takedown notice, so this includes um, proof of the original um, artwork, let's say in this case, uh, a link to the infringing copy on Sketchfab, um, a, you know, a, a summary of you know what's what's happened, uh, contact details, then Sketchfab um, is. Um, Sketchfab has to respond to that. So we take down that content. But in our communication with the person who uploaded that 3D model, for example, where we also make it clear that uh, it can be challenged. So if the, um, the person who has had their model taken down wishes to challenge the, um, the, the takedown request, that's something that happens between that person and the original reporter. Uh, and then that could eventually get the, the, the artwork 3D model restored on Sketchfab, but Sketchfab is bound to respond to uh, well-formed DMCA requests. So you can't just email me and say, hey, I saw this 3D model, it belongs to my friend Dave, and you need to take it down. There needs to be contact details um, so that if you know people wanted to take legal action or enter into a legal dispute, that um, it is uh, it's possible. I hope that, that answers. Yes, thanks. Um, cool. Um, well, we're waiting to see if there's any other any other questions. I um, I, I, I like particularly um, some of what you were saying, Danusha, about the um, the the various existing um, law that that covers a lot of these things. Not only intellectual property law, but also contract law and various other things that that, that covers um, rights to various objects. And we're um, I mean, it was particularly nice to have that discussion today because we're going to have an example of that. Um, in discussion in next week's session on, on restitution and and heritage um, uh, intellectual property and so forth where and one of the things I was going to talk about is the Nefertiti bust which I'm sure you're familiar with the um, the the model which the, the 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 heritage object which is kept in in a museum in Berlin and um, a, a 3d scan of it was made by the museum but not made available to the public and um, and a a version of that 3d model was leaked um, and there's some some question about whether it was the version from the museum or whether it was some sort of you know guerrilla photogrammetry taken in the in the museum itself or 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 something else, um, um, and eventually the another version of this was 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 released by the museum as and so so that 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 sort of discussion and clearly there's there's a there's a conflict there and this is um, um, I mean I'm probably simplifying this but there's conflict not only between their intellectual property rights and and the contract rule but they're, they're both of those really are in conflict even if even if the the museum were correct that they legally had the right to restrict access to a 3d model of that object there's that, that's clearly in conflict with moral rights to you know to this world heritage but also potentially to um to the the own the, you know, the cultural owners of that of that heritage um and and that 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 sort of conflict then become becomes quite interesting to what to what degree is 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 moral rights something that is that is legally recognized um and use a useful thing to think about yeah i mean yeah that's a great question and you know moral rights is something that is really important but also it's not something um you know it's not in the uk at least we are not as strong about it as for example in countries like france where moral rights are very very strong but at the same time, I also this in this area, um, the issue is that, and hopefully you can all hear me still. Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so um, the, the 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 thing with this um, area is that which we talk of conflict, and actually there's conflict also. We talked of conflict between intellectual property and contract, and we had the question about moral rights, but also even within intellectual property. And I say that because if you take other types of um, creative work which are protected by intellectual property, and let's say by copyright, it'd be music, video games, um, art, okay? And um, in these kind of uh, areas, it is very much the, the remit is very much copyright. They don't necessarily, when we talk about video games and uh, when we talk about music, pattern law and trademark law and design law don't really come into the discussion as much. But when we talk about 3D modeling, we talk about 3D scanning, 
and 3D printing, all the intellectual property rights are also in conflict with each other as well. What might be okay with one might not be okay with the other. So there's a conflict just even within an IP. Then like, as you very correctly said, there's a conflict between IP and other rights like contract. And then of course, uh, moral rights is of course part of intellectual property and this is very important. And the example you gave is a great example of, you know, is the work being used in a um, derogatory manner? And, uh, you know, has there been the ability to, you know, stamp your paternity right on it and, make, say, and assert your right on it? Um, so in this kind of situation, how a model is used, how something has been scanned and is again used is something that in this area is going to become more and more important. And just like we have seen with works of parody in the end that we now do have, you know, which has gone through that journey and we have seen how those works can be used in a derogatory way um, and then how intellectual property laws have dealt with it. It will be absolutely the same again for, um, we, are, we are now starting to see these issues. And of course, the example you gave there is a great example of that. And, uh, you know, so yeah, I, you're right about the conflict and also about the importance of moral rights as well as we move forward in this space. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, perhaps if we're if we're waiting for more questions, um, or if anyone else has anything to um, to jump in with, um, I might also just briefly talk a bit about the um, the proposed exercise, and and other people feel free to um, to uh, to chip in. I'll share my screen just briefly there. Um, uh, no, that's someone else's screen there. Um, so the, the exercise that we propose for this session involves um, uploading a file to, to Sketchfab. And so just a couple of notes about that. You can, as, um, as Alicia mentioned at the beginning, you may have a file yourself already that you've um, either created in Blender or SketchUp um, or that you created via photogrammetry in the first session in this, um, in this semester. Um, if you don't already have a file or you can't borrow a file off, off, a, off a friend or colleague um, to work with, um, there are a whole bunch of downloadable files, as um, as Tom pointed out, um, the, the public domain files you can download and you can do anything you want with them. Um, and so you could you could take take one of those files and you know modify it in some way and upload it um, or in, upload it and enrich it with with annotation. Um, annotate do, do the various things. So part of this exercise is to look at the Sketchfab Help Center and see what the various things are you can do once you've got um, your your file uploaded. All the various ways you can edit it, the various different sharing options, the rights you can attach to it, the licenses you can attach to it. Um, Learn, learn about how to add annotations to your file of the kind that um, Tom was also showing and um, and put those um, those sort of things on your um, on your file. And if it's a file you've created yourself, you might want to think a little bit about what you've um, put on there. And then think about um, some of the reasons you, you made the decisions you made about making it available, making it downloadable, what licenses and so forth. And think in particular about those four points that, um, that Tom showed on, on one of his early slides, um, that um, in terms of the, the ethical basis the legal basis, the technical basis, and the practical basis for those decisions um, that you made. So um, you might think if, if you own the object, if you've got an object that is physically in your house, that you own it, you, 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 you own everything to do with that object, you can make do photogrammetry on that object and upload your 3D model. Um, is that still true if this object is, and it doesn't have to be a heritage object, right? I mean, as we said before, when you're doing when you're doing photogrammetry at home, it's whatever you've got at home. I, if you don't happen to have any heritage objects in your house, you can you can scan a, a teddy bear or you know whatever nice object that you have. If you scan a teddy bear, does the company who make and sell that teddy bear still own the um, the copyright in the image of that teddy bear? And therefore, is there any restriction on you uploading that 3D model? Um, these are just, you know, questions that you should ask yourself as you're as you're as you're doing this. I don't necessarily want to argue that you shouldn't upload that teddy bear, um, although maybe maybe um, Tom or Danusha want to quickly jump in and say no, no, don't do it. Um, but 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 these are just the questions questions to be thinking. And you know, what what are, what are um, and are any of those any of those rights in conflict with one another? Are, are, there, are some of the, are there some of the technical and practical considerations at odds with the ethical and legal considerations that you're thinking about the same object? So so it's really this exercise is really to do this practical thing, which is learn how to use Sketchfab to upload and annotate and so forth an object, and then to really think about the implications of every single thing you've done in that in that process. Um, does anyone else want to add anything to that um, to that discussion? 
<laughs> Not really. I mean, um, I just I will just mention that people are uploading um, all kinds of 3D scans. There, there's a huge um, group of um, you might call it, you know, citizen 3D scanners, 3D scanning enthusiasts who publish 3D scans all the time on Sketchfab. Um, and like I say, with the um, it, the increased uh, ease of uh, 3D production, particularly the iPhone, like LiDAR 3D scans, we're seeing people 3D scanning things without probably giving a second thought to what they're, they're scanning. It's like the same way that people will post a picture of a mural on a wall to Instagram because they're there, saw this, liked it, post it. There's that kind of, um, I think, attitude coming in for a certain uh, type of 3D scan. Um, so yeah, no, do I mean the, the, when I mentioned the the terms of use for Sketchfab, it included um, the the clause about the person uploading representing that they own all the rights to that object, and that obviously is something to think about before you upload. But it's also something that, um, in my understanding of, of the terms, is it protects Sketchfab from the liability of that content. It's the 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 burden is on the person uploading it. And for example, the DMCA again protects Sketchfab from um, checking everything that gets uploaded because we respect any request to take down the content. As far as I understand it, I'm not a lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's, that sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Um, any other questions or comments before we finish? I don't think I do. Um, in which case, um, if there's no other questions on um, on YouTube either, I'll um, once again thank Alicia and Tom and Astrid and Dinusha, um, and um, uh, thank you very much. And thank you, the audience. We'll see you um, see you again next week for the session on um, intellectual property and heritage restitution. Um, see you uh, see you then. Thanks very much. Thank you.